Welcome to Question Mark, the podcast, exploring the greatest story ever told with open minds and open hearts. We light it up, we won't come down, and the sun can't stop us now. Watching it come true, it's taking over you. And this is the greatest show, where it's covered in all the colored lights, and the runaways are running the night. Impossible comes true, it's taking over you. And this is the greatest show. Hello and welcome to Question Mark, a fortnightly podcast about the greatest story ever told. Mark's Gospel. My name's Stefan Smart and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through this ancient tale with a surprisingly modern feel. Are you ready to embark on this unique adventure of faith and life? Without further ado, it's time to question Mark. And today I've got my good friend and indeed my church leader, Theo Amer, who's here to talk about chapter five of Question of Mark, verses 21 to 43, the story of Jesus raising a dead girl and healing a sick woman. Welcome. Welcome, Theo. It's lovely to see you. Thanks for coming on to the show. It's a pleasure, Steph. Really good to be here this afternoon um, or whatever time of day, I guess it is when people are watching this, but um, really good to be here. Oh, thanks, Theo. Uh, Theo and I, I better explain to the listener, we, we go back a long way, but Rather than me introducing him, I'd love it if Theo could tell us a little bit about himself. Uh, um, Theo, over to you. So, yeah, well, um, maybe I'll start with how I know Steph. I know Steph through church over many years. I've been inspired by uh, many of the things that he is he's been pushing into over the last few years especially um oh more than the last few years probably 15 20 time flies isn't this Steph but um just that sense of of walking a new path of intimacy with Jesus and and just helping others around him myself included really connect with the heart of God and uh, I've used uh, one of Steph's little books uh, just to really help me explore new areas of prayer. I've experienced Steph leading retreats and that's just been so helpful. We used to do Steph, I don't even remember back in the day, uh, once a month on a Sunday evening, used to come and do a sort of deeper evening, exploratory evening at church, which was was brilliant. And then more recently, probably over the last four or five years, I've had the privilege of um, having Steph as my spiritual director meeting once a month. And, and Steph just always has the ability to um, somehow help me get from my head to my heart um, and i think that's, that's i think if there's one question steph could just ask every time which would really help me um it's just you know and he does is okay theo but what what's what's your heart saying what's god speaking to your heart and um it's just been so helpful just to process some of my journey with god but um in terms of me my name's theo i am married to sarah i've been married for i think about 22 years now i have two uh, beautiful girls one who is 17 just doing her a levels um in the midst of all of the the trauma of trying to navigate that through lockdown over the last two years and uh and uh, another who is 10 years old who is bright as a button got lots of energy and i just feel really blessed to um have a great family but also be part of an amazing church community so steph and i are part of new community church here in southampton and uh just it's an astounding community of people who are all you know all got their flaws just like me but are seeking to follow jesus know what it means to follow him day in day out um to walk with him but also to bring life to those around us that somehow our heart and desire is that we would glorify God. I've got it written above my desk here. My purpose is to glorify God. So I suppose I'm just trying to work out my life um, with Jesus, work out day to day. How can I walk with him, glorify him and um, and honour him in what I do? I get it right some days. More often I get it wrong, but Steph helps me get it right, which is great. Um, But I'm also... but uh, I'm also I'm also a pilot, um, so I, I also a day a week I'm a flying instructor, so I get to I get to get up closer to God is always the joke for my students, you know, <laughs> getting the air and get closer to God. Um, I came to Southampton about 20 years ago as a student, and I got stuck. Basically, I got drawn into an amazing community of church and 
though there are some parts of the world that are perhaps prettier and more exciting to be in actually the community I'm part of is one that I've found it so hard to leave because I don't want to. Uh, I've often thought maybe I could take the whole community with me and move to Hawaii but I don't think that's going to work is it? So that's a bit about me. Um, Brilliant Theo, thanks, that's go. wonderful. Uh, for those who don't know Theo, that is such a good introduction and I recommend getting to know him if you ever get the chance. But today on to serious matters of looking at this passage and we're going to hear now from my good friend Lucy Warner reading the passage for us. Mark chapter 5 verses 22 to 43, New International Version. Jesus raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realised that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciple answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher any more? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion, with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talita kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So there you go. Theo, what an amazing story that is. I just wonder what your first thoughts are about it as you listen to it again. Uh, I, I just find this, um, of all the stories in the gospel, I, I think it's the most moving for me. I, I um, As I just read it again this morning, I, I st parts of it I struggle to read without, um, without just being deeply moved and and um you know without sometimes the tears coming because i see something in it of god's of jesus that kindness and compassion and um there's just a depth to that i think it's his i don't know if it's about his humanity it's his character though i think the character of jesus that comes through in it and and the line that gets me every time is the one where you know the the woman who's been bleeding all these years has touched his robe and he's looked around to find out how who she is and and she comes forward interesting what I, she comes for the I, I'm in, in the nlt the frightened woman trembling here's this trembling woman who's yeah. terrified in this moment she's been completely healed and jesus just says to her with such compassion and kindness daughter your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. And there's just something of Jesus' heart that I I glimpse there. Yeah. Um, that goes so much beyond 
you know, a miracle worker doing people some favours. Yes. Um, yes. Or God helping us out because we really need it. Uh, here is here is a God who is so present and so engaged with this individual in this moment. They have his undivided attention. His heart is absolutely full of love for for them. And you just get that glimpse. And you see it again at the end with the the kindness and gentleness of Jesus as he says to the, the little girl, you know, Talitha, come, little girl, get up, takes her by the hand. Yes. You know, there's this moment he he could have stood off the corner of the room and go, right, be healed, and I'm off, I've I've got something else to do now. But he stays in that moment, says, get her something to get her something to eat. You know, she's gonna be hungry. I, I think that it just it reveals something to me of God's kindness and compassion and I think challenges me on days when um when I just need to hear that for myself yeah uh, and so I love this passage and it feels a real privilege to be able to spend the next little bit of time talking about it that's wonderful Theo that's amazing what you shared about Jesus's character and his kindness it reminds me actually of um without wanting to blow my own trumpet of the performance which I do in I am Mark and I remember the day when my director said to me you know with this woman you really just can't be standing off from her so I, I do it as a solo performance as you know so it's hard to do two characters but she was my director was really adamant she said you you just can't do that so what she got me to do in the end was to kind of bend down as Jesus and and pick up this imaginary woman from the ground as it were raise her up and then when I say the word daughter, I just bring her close to me and give her this incredible hug, which would have been totally out of the ordinary in that culture, probably. But it is, it was so moving just doing that as an actor. When I did it for my director for the very first time, she just burst into tears. So kind of just reiterating the tenderness mm. of that moment and the, the personal interest that Jesus takes in this individual and I guess what you're saying is we can assume that he takes that kind of interest in us yeah which is which is something we know don't we in our in our head we know that's the truth and reality but to allow that to actually filter down to our hearts and and to to connect with the depth of who we are is 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 so powerful and it feels it can be hard to take in can't it I, I know many times i've i've just been astounded at god you know there's times when i i've said to god look i i know i know that you love me but i don't understand why yeah. I, I don't it doesn't make any sense why would god love someone like me who tries his best but messes up half the time is self-absorbed far too much of the time and 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 yet by I'm, i i i am so far from measuring up to any of god's standards yes. and yet he has chosen to love me fully and completely and it doesn't make any sense at all to me yeah. It's, and yet it is what it is yeah. and i think i glimpsed some of that in this so i'm just seeing you even there steph you know just just you know, mimicking that and, and, and acting out that part of your performance. I, I found that really moving. Yes. <laughs> um, and I suppose it's, it, and I think the thing for me is as I've, as I've understood what's going on behind the story, we've got a few verses here for here, here haven't we? You know, as far as we're concerned in the Western context, oh, well, there's a woman who's had a bleeding problem and doctors haven't been able to sort her out. Life's been a bit more inconvenient than it would normally be. And suddenly she's healed. But the, the, the probability of that backstory, meaning that because she's been bleeding all that time, she's richly unclean. Yeah. The, and, and my understanding of, of the laws, Levitical laws, and certainly the way they've been interpreted, was that if a woman um, had been menstruating and sitting on a bed, that piece of furniture becomes unclean. Anywhere she's been, anything she's touched. So, so it's impossible for anyone to be within a house with her without them also becoming unclean. Mm -hmm. And being actually clean is so important that actually she's been, she's like a leper really, potentially, isn't she? Yes. That's the possibility of the story, that she is unable to have a normal functioning relationship with anyone in her community. Mm -hmm. And so this compassion of Jesus 
it's not just a kind word to someone in a moment it's absolutely restoration for her yes. of her life yeah you know we look at the little girl later on and and there's this resurrection moment but i think i think jesus already instigated a, 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 a resurrection moment just you know half an hour before yes. in that yes. this woman she's had a life given back yes she's had the inconvenience and difficulty of 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 bleeding so much but actually it's it's given her life back it's given her community back it's you know rest the resurrection for us restores us into community with god doesn't it and it also restores us into community with one another the church and here in this resurrection moment jesus restores this woman into her community that she's been ostracized from potentially for 12 years and so there's so much here that is so powerful and speaks so much to to the resurrection and what Jesus has done for us that um yeah it it it's remarkable yeah i mean i i don't know about that particular story but i know in the story of the girl the idea of resurrection is really pointed isn't it because mm. the words in greek which are used for stand up and get up which are repeated quite a lot are the same words which are used to describe jesus's resurrection so there's a sense in which this is some way in some way meant to stand for something stands for stand it stands for that that the power of jesus's own death and resurrection but also of what resurrection means for us as believers you know we were in that place of the woman i guess we were in that place of being at odds with god being at odds with others even though we would want to do our best and God comes into our lives and restores things as they were meant to be that relationship with God and relationship with our fellow human beings which is based not on one-upmanship and competition and the fittest and the strongest being the best but actually on a relationship of service and and equality I kind of completely revolutionary new way of life which we've been given it's like not a not a blueprint that we follow like a manifesto which we read in a, in a little red book but it's something within us isn't it it's a, it's a life a new life a resurrection kind of life that's been given and people who are listening to this might wonder how did i get to that point from this story but honestly it's there again and again in mark's gospel you, you're going to have to take my word for it I, I like the point you made actually about the restoration into community. And you know that bit which I just just kind of acted out where he picks her up and he brings her to his chest and says, daughter. I think the very word daughter is mm. symptomatic of that, that yeah. obviously cared for, but also part of a relationship, part of a family again no longer on the outskirts or no longer potentially ostracized uh, included again yeah and that that's helpful even in my understanding because that i've never thought in depth about that particular word but that word daughter is the word that every time i read it just catches me mm. um there's something in that of the tenderness of jesus and but it's 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 a t it's something in the way Jesus sees her. Yeah. There's something precious in it, isn't there? And as a as a father myself with two daughters, there's something, you know, it's it's something wonderful about the relationship between a father and a daughter. And there's moments, you know, my my youngest when we you know snuggle in bed at night to read a story before she goes to sleep, which we I try and do, you know, most nights. There's a precious moment. There's something precious in that relationship, and you see something of that heart of jesus there don't you towards this woman um she's not just a stranger she's just not a random who's turned up she he knows her yes doesn't he somehow he knows her and he is in this deep relationship of father daughter to her somehow and i think he's honoring, honoring her as well that you know she is really valuable a daughter is someone who's close to one's heart and precious, as you say, not someone perhaps who others might despise, as she may fear that's the, the case, but actually the opposite. 
is true. So he's raising her in in dignity as well, isn't he? I think that's extraordinary. But I agree. There's all those connotations that you said as well. That sense of intimacy uh, mm. and closeness. It's amazing. Just one cool. word. And I wonder there's almost a sense of protection here, isn't there, in Jesus? I, I wonder is mm. in that here's this woman who has had to publicly admit that she's in a crowd of people clearly thronging around, touching. Mm. She's ceremonially unclean. She shouldn't have been there mm. um, rubbing shoulders with all these other people. She sh certainly shouldn't have been touching a rabbi. And in this moment, there, I guess there was a risk that the crowd could turn on her um in some way and yet it's almost this this moment of protection of her it feels like to me he's going he doesn't even let any of that come in he just hold well we don't know does he hold her quite possibly <laughs> yeah. but he says daughter and he commends her doesn't he yeah. he commends her for her faith he's he's holding her up as an example in that moment against everything that the culture would be showing and i think like you said steph just the dignity he shows her as a woman yes is immensely powerful particularly i, I would imagine in that culture yeah. at the time amazing i think you mentioned the word faith that big the f word if you like in this passage which is really really important what was it about her faith that clearly impressed him so much so much that he's able to say to her your faith has healed you that's a stirring statement it, but it begs a load of questions mm. as well what was it do you think that he was so impressed with i i don't know i wonder if there's something there's a, there's almost a dogged determination that she's shown isn't there yeah. she's secretly and privately pushed through the crowds and and come to Jesus in a difficult circumstance and at some risk to herself, hasn't she? Yeah. You know, I know some people say, don't they? No, faith is spelled R I S K. You've probably heard that in church on various occasions. And I, I just come to me now, I wonder if there's something of the risk that she's taken. Yeah. And, and she's probably. Her own status, I mean, although her status is already under question, yeah. even more to be able to do this, this horrific, horrific act. Yeah. Yeah, to do this and risk risk the vitriol potentially in that moment of the of the crowd, maybe, and also to risk disappointment. Yes, actually, here she is. She's she 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 has no other hope, does she? Yeah. She's she's destitute by the sound of things. She spent all her money on doctors. It's been twelve years. She's potentially been ostracized by her community. And you know, if this doesn't work, you know, is that was she at the point? If this doesn't work, I might as well give up living because. There is no hope. And and so that moment when we step out in faith and the things when we step out in faith, we don't know if it's going to work. Do we? Otherwise, it wouldn't be faith. True. And yet somehow it comes true. She's taken the risk um, and she's think, seen everything change. Is it something of that, you think? I, I think it is. I think it is. I, I don't know if I, we together are going to get the answer here, but it seems to me to be central to what Mark's about in this story because he reiterates this idea of faith so i guess we are on a good journey here and trying to understand what that might mean or imply i think i think what you've said is is absolutely true so if we take in on that on board and think about our, our own faith is our own faith of that quality where we <laughs> would risk in the way she's risked um but i also wonder I mean, I, I'm not saying I'm right, but it makes me wonder whether there's a faith in something rather than just faith for its own sake, if you see what mm. I mean. The faith in a person is what's of particular interest to me, that she reaches out, not just to anybody, but she reaches out to this man. And she seems to know, it's not just a maybe, maybe not. She seems to know that he will, if I can just touch his clothes, I will be healed, she says. There's something about that knowledge and that, this, that uh, I don't know, willingness to put one's life at someone else's disposal in that way. And that has to be something huge. Um, so in, I wonder whether that's part of it. She's willing to not only trust, but also to trust in this man, Jesus. 
Mm. It, it's easy, isn't it, to almost have faith from a distance? Yeah. Um, you know, in that sense of I, I, I believe God heals. I believe God can heal. It's a, it's another thing to actually step out in faith and offer to pray for someone for healing, for example, who is a stranger and yet you know needs it. Yeah. There's something about putting your money where your mouth is, isn't there? <laughs> yes. That is that is, is that I suppose it's it's closing the gap between just a nice consensual faith yeah. an idea yes and actually putting it into action um i also but i really do think it's about this implicit trust you know i find i think human beings find it hard to trust each other actually you know trust is not easily gained and often it can be disappointed but in this case, this is a trust in an individual who is completely reliable. And yeah. she's gone for it. I mean, she's, she's let all her defences down. There's nothing in the way, as far as she's concerned, this man is completely trustworthy. I, I you know, I'm, hope I'm not making too much out of this story. It just feels that that might well be the case. And uh, something about because I think faith in the story so far in Mark has been about trust in the person. That's why I think I'm saying this. Just in the previous chapter, of course, it's the, the storm at sea. And Jesus says to his disciples, what, why did you have, why were you afraid? Do you still have no faith? I don't think it's just about them going over the water, trusting they'll be okay. Although it's partly that. It's about them going over the water with him. <laughs> That's a different matter entirely. Or there's something about what Jesus represents that's of importance here. So, yeah, I think there's and more there's, to be looked at there. I think there is, and there's there's a quite a contrast, isn't there, between this woman and the disciples? Yes, indeed. In that the woman displays this level of faith in Jesus that she does say, you know, I knew that if, if she just touched um, his robe, then she would be healed yeah. and that you know whether it's she just was going willing to risk it or whether i mean it sounds i i i'm i'm coming i'm really coming around to that sense that you're having of that strong sense of faith that is she knew there was something that she knew in the core of who she was that if she did this it would happen yeah which makes me think at one level what what did she, how did she know of jesus had she just heard stories or had she been observing him from a distance or you know from the edge of the crowd but over the weeks as he'd been ministering but then you contrast it with the disciples who you know they've been there they've taken part um in the feeding of the five thousand it's a couple of chapters further on isn't it they've been part of the feeding of the five thousand and they've been involved in it. they've been handing out the baskets and then just a chapter or two later it's the feeding of the four thousand and um jesus says the same sort of thing again you know oh, what about these people they've been with me for a long time and they haven't got any food you know what are we going to do about it almost and then oh, i don't know what we can do we haven't got any food i've got enough better send them home you know they've <laughs> seen it they've been part of it yeah. and yet they, they don't go oh jesus do again what you did they're like oh i don't know how, how do we fix that one it, which seems such a contrast doesn't it or such a lack of faith yeah compared to um compared to the woman yeah well it's fascinating you should say that because I, I i may be controversial but i wonder whether the disciples end up being people who aren't really great models of faith actually this isn't the only story is it as you say no. um it kind of that I, I guess from our point of view as we read that we kind of get some encouragement we think oh good the, <laughs> the disciples weren't complete models of faith well that's okay it lets us off the hook in a way but actually what what uh, what comes across is this idea of the others who are unexpected having faith so you say the woman in this case and I just remember there's another woman who who similarly uh responds to Jesus the, the mother G, um Simon's mother-in-law, who is, she responds. Is there something about, I don't know, some people seem to respond. Some people seem to get it, don't they? And and, and there's the Sidonian woman, isn't there? Isn't there? Yeah, that's the other um, one. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and has that little kind of 
not argument, that sort of tete tete as it were, with Jesus, doesn't she? Where he says, "Look, I've not come for the for the, for the dogs, for the Gentiles yet," mm -hmm. and she says, "Yeah, but but you'll even um, the dogs eat um, the crumbs underneath the table, and as a result, Jesus heals." I, I can't remember. I think it's her daughter, isn't it? I yes, think it's daughter. Right, yes. um, and you know, he says, "Well, well responded." It's almost this point where Jesus is persuaded to heal again by a woman. Yes. Isn't really interesting. Very interesting. Again, it's a woman in that situation. Um, and I, I wonder there, you know, what Mark's doing as a, as a gospel writer is there is such a sense of, there is a sense of elevating women in a very patriarchal, um, masculine dominated world yes. of actually calling out these, these women of faith. Um, and without and, wanting to put either of us down, I actually think, I mean, I, this could be incredibly sexist depending on how you listen to or, or, or see this, but I feel often women do have this sense of depth of faith and spiritual sensitivity that we men actually lack often. I don't know if you'd agree with that. I mean, that's a yeah. statement I appreciate, but it, it has an element of truth, I'm sure. I, I I think in my experience it does, and I just look at Sarah, my my own wife. There's a there's a I don't know. One is it is it that women on the whole are just more in touch with their hearts than yes. perhaps us men often tend to be, and with that comes a, a maybe an acceptance of Jesus, an acceptance of faith that perhaps isn't wrestled around as much as, as and I'm sure look you know we're not wanting to you know walk into controversial territory um but I think often that does seem to be the case doesn't it in in my experience that we're all different but sometimes as men we're we're in our heads and there's something we need to prove and is there something about being independent or you know alpha male that we have to somehow find our own way rather than just walking that sensitivity of faith but there's a sensitivity as well isn't there there's a sensitivity that many women have yes in terms of faith yes so i think many of us men <laughs> could learn from yes exactly talking of learning uh, from mm. women I, I mean i i just wonder whether that's part of the reason why these two stories are kind of banded together because they are organized very strangely aren't they because you start off with the story of Jairus asking Jesus to heal his daughter or save her from probable death and and then you get the woman interrupting that bit and then you go back to Jairus and it is fascinating we were talking earlier weren't we about how many links there are between the stories just in terms of the words that are used mm. the word touch is used in both the word the number 12 is is referred to in both the word for heal or save is used for both the word for faith or courageous trust is used in both it's it seems that mark almost wants us to keep comparing the two that they are meant to be seen as a pair that's why we're looking at them today together um and in terms of learning i i have not really occurred to me until i started preparing for this this podcast but I think if you think about the quality of faith that these two individuals had, there is a difference. So the woman has this incredible strength of faith and doggedness, as we put it. And Jairus obviously has faith because he, he comes to Jesus in the first place. But then when he hears that his daughter's dead, Jesus has to say to him, don't be afraid, just believe. And I, I can't rule out the possibility in my head that the woman's still there and Jairus has seen everything that's happened so it's like she is the example don't be afraid just believe like this woman like her she is the model so it's the woman teaching the man potentially which is fascinating thing isn't it it is isn't it and first often when I, as I've read that I've put myself in Jairus's position and trying to imagine what does it feel like to be Jairus yeah. as I found Jesus he's come back to the lake the right side of the lake just at the right time my daughter's sick thinks she's dying come and heal him and then Jesus wanders through these crowds and then just stops 
looks around says who touched me and the disciples are going what he's what are you talking about jesus and jairus is there saying come on come on my daughter she's dying you know inside he might not be saying outwardly but inside and then jesus stops and have this lovely conversation what's jairus's you know what's jairus's uh, demeanor towards that woman in that moment is an entirely positive one of enjoying the wonder of this healing or just going this this blimmin woman interrupting jesus when my daughter's just about to die and then gets the news a moment later it's too late yeah he, you know the servants come don't they and yeah. say to jairus you yeah. know it's too late don't bother the master anymore she's dead and in that moment just that why why god why did you inter why would jesus why didn't you hurry woman what on earth are you doing yeah. I, I i can imagine maybe i'm putting too much of my own personality onto that but i can imagine in that moment that that frustration that that horror that feeling that everything was lost if only jesus had not been interrupted if only this woman hadn't come forward yeah. and yet jesus in that moment speaks faith into him doesn't he yeah. and 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 maybe uh, i need that faith spoken into me more often than not um yeah. you know uh yeah. but what what would it feel like yeah i mean again here is an example of maybe where we need to be looking at our own lives as you say you know what, what is our faith experience what is our experience of faith when we come to prayer when we think when we see things like you've explained amazingly graphically things are completely against our hopes and our dreams and what we want it seems to be going completely wrong we might have come to jesus but it doesn't seem to be working out so <laughs> what's what's the response going to be and is it at that point that you know if we are still enough we could hear the lord say to us don't be afraid just believe and that that's incredibly challenging isn't it but it's very it it's full of promise nevertheless it is and it, 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 it it's something that i've often heard god say to me um in the moments when i've just been you know a bit my wits end or struggling or frustrated or things just don't seem to be working out I, I, the number of times god has just said to me say just have faith yeah and and it can feel in that moment um if i if i take it on and hear it it's incredibly reassuring mm. that actually i don't have to have everything worked out it doesn't have to be working out the way i need it to yeah. but i can trust god or often as well i have a sense of jesus saying trust me theo yes and and again maybe it's that male aspect of just wanting to make things and do things for ourselves and get things moving yeah get things um, sorted out get things sorted out you know i wouldn't let have do it like that i'd do it like this and again <laughs> it's not happening yes. having to, having to trust and you know maybe part of jesus wandering almost it feels slowly through those crowds and allowing himself to be interrupted was a lesson in trust and faith to jairus and the disciples yeah so jesus didn't need to rush did he no because he he knew that he had the power whether or not in that moment he had he knew that the outcome or well, the outcome would be with Jairus' daughter i don't know but he certainly knew he he was sufficient his power was sufficient whether she lived or died to restore and resurrect and there's something of us learning to trust jesus in that sense that no matter what it looks like around us we can trust yes. we can walk in faith yes. that ultimately the good news of jesus will come true in our lives and possibly not in the ways that we expect yeah <laughs> and it's there that, is a in life. the idea you you hit the nail on the head for me i mean i really hope i can actually live this out in my in my own life the idea that jesus doesn't hurry and so often we want him to or we want him to do things at the moment we want him to do them but often there's this kind of slowness, or I don't know if that's your experience, it has been to a large extent mine, where things don't happen in the, exactly the way, as you say, or at the time that one expects. That doesn't mean to say that God's left us. In fact, the opposite is true. It's just that it's different. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think my experience of that is that often god wants to 
teach us something on the journey that we just don't learn if we just get from A to B straight away, do we? Yeah, that's right. We if we if we just jump on the motorway and we get off in a two junctions time and we're there, we get there quickly. But there's something of the journey, the scenic route that sometimes God wants to take us. And I know for us, for Sarah and I, we had a um, between our two daughters, which is why there's a gap of about seven and a half years between them. We had we had eight miscarriages and it was a really, really tough time. And with each pregnancy um, that then ended in miscarriage, we kind of took a different approach of sometimes just trying to declare in faith, you know, walk in faith and Bible verses every day. And we're declaring this baby's going to live and all of this sort of stuff. And still it died. And other times when we we pray in a different way or we read scriptures, it, it felt like there were ways of us trying to enact our faith and walk in our faith. And I still remember, um, I mean, the way uh, the final pregnancy came around and Bethan was born, there's a whole miraculous story of God's prophetic speaking into that, which I, I, I won't go into. It's just a long story, but a powerful sense of God speaking, um, quite miraculous. Um, but by that last pregnancy, not knowing if we'd have exactly the same experience as the others we got i, I just got to the point where I, I, my only prayer was this was god have mercy on us mm. that was all i could pray mm. god would you have mercy on us and remarkably in the circumstances were quite incredible out of that my daughter bethan was born who is an absolute delight but there was something of almost coming to a point of not trying to work it out spiritually not trying to twist God's arm, not trying to do the right Christian stuff to make this happen, but just going, God, I'm at your mercy on this one. I've got to just let you do what you would do. And I look back on that time and um, we had some really, really tough times and some really difficult moments. But I can say that I wouldn't I wouldn't change it because I discovered and so did Sarah, we discovered God's goodness and closeness in ways and in depths that we have never experienced before or since. And we found that in the worst of times, uh, and there were some really, really bad times, and one particular day when we were in hospital, when these miscarriages was going on and we were there, we, we somehow, we experienced God's kindness in a deep and profound way that should not have been possible in that moment, in that circumstance, that should not have been it, it, it should have been absolutely the opposite for us. Yeah. And yet we experienced his kindness in that afternoon. It's this moment in my memory. It's just absolutely, you know, seared on my memory of God's goodness at a time when everything around us was badness. And I wouldn't change that for the world. Because, yeah. because we met with Jesus yeah. in a way that, a happy life and a wandering through and babies popping out would have been great joy and uh, and would have been wonderful. But actually, I met Jesus in a way that I wouldn't have met him otherwise. And, and there's something about that journey and that patience. And we weren't patient. <laughs> we wanted it over. But he allowed us to walk through something that revealed his his kindness to us. And... And I'm grateful to him for that. Thank you, Theo, for that incredible, moving story. You know, it reminds me of something about people who may not know quite what you're talking about when you say, I, I took all of that. It was horrible, but actually at the end of it, I look back and I think back to it as a precious time because I met Jesus, that some, some who are listening may not understand what that means. But I think, I think we can both testify, can't we, to this person meeting this person as the most incredible thing that's ever happened to us in our lives. And being close to him beats anything that this world can give us in terms of happiness or riches or popularity all the things that we would normally look to get it pales vastly into insignificance doesn't it when it comes to a relationship with this this god 
of ours, Jesus Christ. You know, it does. For me personally, it's I'm at a kind of crossroads in my life. I have to make big choices about the future. There's a choice of comfort and there's a choice of challenge. I know the one which I'll meet Jesus in. And so that's the one, the challenging choice, despite its difficulty, I've decided I'm taking because I'll be going with him on that particular journey. That beats everything. It doesn't matter in some ways as to the difficulties that might come about. Wow. We had so much else to talk about didn't we though about this passage and I remember mm -hmm. when we were talking about this before we started recording you were talking about something to do with the woman in the passage and the Old Testament and I, I just wonder whether we could kind of skip back to that and maybe change gear a bit to talk a little bit about what you found out there would that be possible? Yeah absolutely I think I think what's fascinating in, you know, I think throughout the Gospels, and we see it here in Mark, is that there's a sense, especially recognising the Jewish audience of Mark, uh, and my understanding would be that it's probably a mixture of Gentile and Jewish audience. Um, Matthew seemed to be more geared towards a Jewish audience, didn't it? Perhaps looped more towards a Gentile. Mark a little bit of a mixture. But presenting something of Jesus in light of the prophets of old and the prophets of old the Old Testament and those journeys through so you've got to have Abraham and Moses Elijah Elisha in particular who were these great prophets who who kind of channeled as it were the power of God and you see with Elijah that sense that Elijah does a certain number of miracles. Um, Elisha seems to do almost double the number of miracles that uh, that Elijah does, and there's a sense of him having a double portion. But then this this sense across the Gospels of Jesus being so much more than them and doing even more miracles. So, for example, Elijah raises one person from the dead. Elisha, you could claim it's two. Uh, there's one person that he raises from the dead and the second one gets raised from the dead when um, someone's body is thrown into Elisha's tomb and they touch his bones and he comes alive. But Jesus, there are three. There's um, the widow's son at Nain. There's the, the, the girl in this story. And then, of course, there's Lazarus. And then, of course, Jesus rising himself. So that sense of progression of illustrating. And and this story in Mark is really interesting because if you look back at the story in 2 Kings 4 of Elisha raising the Shumanite woman's son to life, there are so many parallels um, in the story between the two the two passages. So um, for example, um, it's uh, it's a seemingly wealthy parent who goes to seek out the man of God. Um, in order, Jairus, the synagogue ruler, the Shumanite woman, there's suggestions that she was probably quite wealthy and well off. She right. goes to find Elisha because her son's died. Jairus goes to find Jesus because his daughter's died. Um, the response of the man of God to actually go with them, uh, the point that actually on the journey back in both stories is a point of disappointment. And Gehazi, Elisha's uh, servant, uh, when Elisha's sort of halfway there with him and comes back and says, I've put the staff on this boy and it hasn't worked. Mm. You know, you get the, the the mourners coming and saying to Jesus, don't bother, it hasn't, you know, the, the child's dead. Um, and there's so many parallels in that. Uh, in both of them. It's really worth, have a read of, of that in, in, in 2 Kings 4. It's worth anyone listening and read that, seeing that. But I think the contrast is what's really important as well. Um, so firstly, recognising that probably Jewish readers, as they read this or had it read to them, would have almost certainly been thinking back to Elisha and the Shumanite woman um, and her son being raised from the dead by Elisha. But here, I think the things, the real contrast is both in the level of compassion that we see in Jesus. And we always already talked about that, haven't we? And the kindness, but also in the, the greater level of power that Jesus exhibits. Mm. So talking about the compassion bit first of all um elisha is a bit reluctant to go on the journey initially with the, the shumanite woman travels quite a long way travels to find him 
Elisha first of all just wants to send his servant Gehazi to put his staff on. And the woman pleads, says, no way, I'm not going anywhere without you, Elisha. You're coming back. Um, so he does. And then and then Elisha gets this sense of urgency and rushes. Whereas with Jesus, you see that immediate response. You see the compassion in him as he meets the woman on the way, but also that tenderness with the little girl, which you just don't see with Elisha. But when it comes to the power, Elisha calls out to God. Pray for everyone out the room, calls out to God, lies down on the boy twice a couple of times and really seems to sort of wrestle and need God to provide the power. Whereas the ease with which Jesus heals, he simply goes in and he touches the girl and he speaks to her. And in that moment, she's healed. And this this contrast, I think Mark is really clearly trying to draw out that actually, whereas Elisha was looking to God for the source of power. He was the conduit through which the power came. Actually, Jesus was the source from which the power came. So that contrast, which almost certainly to a Jewish reader would have been very obvious at the time. You're saying there's a sense in which Jesus's divinity is being highlighted here. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it's front and centre yes. um, in this passage. And you see it twice, don't you? You see it with the the, the woman who touched the garment. It, it just, it came from him. It, it, you know, she she came to touch Jesus and just out of him came this this power from his divinity. Yes. Um, and there's there's that real sense there of of this journey. And and, and um, I, I, was, I was reading a little earlier, um, uh, a scholar just saying how in Jewish understanding a sort of time and story, it's not just linear. There's a certain um, uh, secular nature to it. So a lot of the stories are almost repeated, repeated, repeated in different forms mm. as there's a sort of cycle of story that comes through. And here's this cycle of Jesus demonstrating power in a way that has been seen before in the New Testament in a number of occasions. But it's like the fulfillment of what's previously gone because he is the actual source wow. of divine power rather than just another conduit of it so it's this sort of spiraling up to this point of i suppose this pinnacle of of divine power enacted so, and coming through jesus without wanting to take away anything from that really central point what you're also underlying is the importance of reading the bible in its context that it's not just one book in the bible uh it's actually a part of a progression throughout the word of god similarly mark's gospel can't be read in in episodic form as we're doing actually in this podcast because we have to take into account all that's gone before and all that's coming after as well it's part of the same thing it's fascinating isn't it and i think there as well steph i think you, you alluded to earlier didn't you that sense that you know as well as recognizing what's gone before and i think you're absolutely right reading scripture as a whole and 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 seeing where there are where the Old Testament points to Jesus yes. in so, so many places. And the more I've looked at it, um, the more you, you see it in really quite remarkable places that aren't necessarily obvious at first. But also, like you were saying about pointing forward, that sense of this resurrection story pointing forward to Jesus' own resurrection. Um, and obviously the resurrection of the little girl but just a, a couple of things there the fact that um jesus gave her something to eat yes in that moment you, you see that same sort of reflection after jesus rises from the dead and he he eats with the disciples or breaks bread after the and the journey to emmaus and then again on the beach with the disciples that eating together there's that eating after resurrection yes. isn't there which is really interesting part that sort of mirrored there as well yeah so yeah it's it's fascinating it's a, it's a part of this passage i'm honestly not as sure about as other things but it does feel to it does seem to have that feel of a story being played out if you like prefigured um jesus's crucifixion apparently that's the end of the story isn't it uh just like the girl she's dead you know, why bother the teacher anymore? It's nothing you can do about it. But Jesus says, no, she's she's sleeping. And as we said earlier, the, the, the verbs that are used about her getting up and standing up are the same words used of his resurrection. I mean, I read a commentary 
recently that suggested maybe for some of G of Mark's listeners, um, the cross was the end. There was no other story apart from that. You know, this criminal apparently, because he had to be a criminal if he was being crucified, had been killed. But actually, what Mark is at pains to point out is no, he rose again, and that makes all the difference. Yeah, it it it, it means that it's only the beginning of the story rather than the exactly. end, doesn't it? Exactly. Because it change it change it just changes absolutely everything yes that's and, why and that, yes sorry go on yeah that's, I was gonna say, and in that moment where it feels like everything is lost yes and that's why you know people talk about the upside down kingdom don't they because in that moment maybe a bit like we were talking about earlier you know in the place of some of my darkest pain i've discovered the the brightness of jesus um you know in this moment everything is lost this man that the disciples have followed is crucified, it's the end. Actually, he turns everything on its head and that is the beginning. And that becomes that point of weakness, becomes the absolute center of power. Yes. For yes. the transformation of, of the world, well, doesn't exactly, it? Exactly, exactly. And that's why I wonder, this story is actually called the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ the son of God. And that's the first verse. But some, some people say that's the title, which I can readily believe. What is this all about, this beginning? Well, if there are 16 chapters of this story, what you've just said fits perfectly. The beginning, it's happened. It, it seemed like the end at the end. It wasn't. It's the beginning of something completely new. God's new creation, the kingdom of God coming to earth and basically taking over um extraordinary i wonder if there's something for us to learn in that just day to day we few of us like endings do we yeah. you know it's it, um often we mourn the end of a season um especially if it's one we've enjoyed uh, try even the transitions in life or um because what comes beyond is unknown but maybe there's something about recognizing that often in endings if we trust god in it there is a new beginning that will come even if that becomes a painful ending you know um there is a new life and i, I think that's borne out isn't it um in 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 life we perhaps move on from a job that we enjoyed and we can't do it anymore for whatever reason or maybe a bereavement and there is that sadness and there is loss but often just as spring follows winter there is something of new life that god gives us beyond that which is sometimes really unexpected yeah. and unanticipated yes. um that maybe there's something of god's grace in that to us yeah it's wonderful i'll tell you one or two things so this this podcast is you know a bit longer perhaps than others but it's such a fascinating subject we could go on and on couldn't we theo I think, yeah, perhaps, we do, I, I think perhaps we ought to perhaps draw things gradually to a close. Let's give each other one last thing to say, which we haven't mentioned so far. And if it was you choosing one more thing to say, what would it be? Would it be <laughs> uh, a new point, a question, anything? Um, I, I think just how much I've enjoyed this, Steph, really. It's been great. <laughs> Um, and I think it just shows what value there is in in really looking at scripture. Yeah, we can so much of the time read about scripture um, or, or or read books that allude to it, but there is something about just sitting down with a passage, isn't there? Allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us, allowing being open to hearing one another that. There is a faith that God can, we're talking about faith, aren't we here today? But there's a faith that God can build in us by simply going, let's just explore his word together because it is life, isn't it? And life comes out. So I think that's probably, that for me is, is what I'd like to say. That's wonderful. I agree entirely with what you were saying. And there were the moments of our conversation, which I felt, you know, the hairs kind of standing up in the back of my neck because it just felt so powerful and energizing. You really did sense that God was in it. Um, 
I think if I were to say one more thing, I, I know my mentor, John Burnett, would never forgive me if I didn't mention this. There's um, an aspect of Mark's gospel which I'm becoming increasingly aware of. It may not be everybody's belief, but for me, there's, there's often an economic or political aspect to what's going on, as well as the personal. And there's something about status here which really intrigues me. We talked about the woman and versus the man, the woman being perhaps the less kind of, um, uh, I don't know, high status um, part of that society as opposed to the man. But not only that, I think the fact that she's a woman who's lost all her money, she has no money, <laughs> she's destitute, she's always associated with a crowd. It says the crowd is linked with her name several times. And the crowd in Mark's gospel is often the, the poorer sort, not, not the rich, not the privileged. So you have her, a member of the poorer group, and then you have the richer, high status, gyrus figure, the leader of a community. And as I said earlier, I think she's the one who Jesus uses to model to Jairus. At any rate, the, the two are considered as equal. They are dealt, they are kind of treated in exactly the same way. I think that's a wonderful way to end our podcast. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> our God doesn't see things the way we do. No. He, he sees everyone as the same, as equal, and worthy of his love equally. Mm. And you see that in the way Jesus is willing to be interrupted by this lowly woman and not just follow the powerful person and give the attention there. He's like, he can wait. <laughs> this woman has my attention now. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it, it's wonderful, isn't it? And I find that so challenging for myself, you know, just in the way I, my, my attempts to treat everyone equally, but it's so easy to be swayed even subconsciously, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, by status or position or just I, I don't know those we find it easy to get on with and yet Jesus Jesus yeah every time I look at Jesus I'm I'm so deeply challenged some would say what we're talking about is the heart of the gospel and thinking about Jesus talking to his disciples and two of them coming later in the story to say you know, when you, you know, come into your kingdom, can I sit on your right? And uh, my brother, can he sit on the left? And the other disciples get all angry with those two disciples. And Jesus said, no, no, listen, it's not about who's the greatest. That's not the point. Whoever is the greatest is the one who serves the other. Mm. I think that's, that's, that's the mm. new life. That <laughs> The upside down kingdom again. Upside isn't it? down. Exactly. If you enjoyed this episode of Question Mark and don't want to miss any future episodes, be sure to click on the subscribe button. This also means other people can find the podcast and join the conversation too. We'd also love if you could leave a review so we know what was good and what we can improve for future episodes. If you want to find out more about I Am Mark, Stefan Smart's solo word for word dramatization of Mark's gospel, go to www sleek.bio slash I am Mark, where you can sign up for free for his newsletter and a whole host of other goodies. Join us and our special guests next time, where we'll continue to explore the greatest story ever told together. If you want to get involved with the podcast or have any questions or comments in the meantime, please do get in touch using the I am Mark social media channels. We'd love to hear from you. We'll light it up, we won't come down And the sun can't stop us now Watching it come true, it's taking over you and This is the greatest show Where it's covered in all the colored lights And the runaways are running the night Impossible comes true, it's taking over you and This is the greatest show